But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is theopneustos, God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Theopneustos is the description offered then for the authority of Scripture itself. That it is God who breathes into these words, who breathes into these authors, and offers to us His testament and His testimony what we ought to know. What do you want to know about God? We just play. Well, what do you want to know about salvation? What do you want to know about us? What do you want to know about the relationship? <coughs> Read God's words and be taught. Be rebuked, be corrected, and be trained in righteousness so that we might be equipped, thoroughly equipped, for every good work, for that which God wants us to do. It is theopneustos and their for us. His words of Holy Scripture are both supreme and are foundational <coughs> understanding. Our supreme and also foundational rule of life. Our supreme and our foundational authority. An authority under which I preach here and now. And if anything, it's good for me and better for you because this is my own protection and yours that I don't lead you astray. Even our service is constructed in such a manner where the Theopneustos, the God-breathed word, is both pinning me in from one side to the next and trying to balance out anything that I might say. Because apparently, there will come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine and they will want to hear what they want to hear. Their ears will itch and they will be surrounded by speakers who tell them the <coughs> words that are sweet and compelling what it is that they want to hear. And it will stroke egos, or make them feel good, or inspire them, or whatever it might be. But sound doctrine, it won't be. And maybe, because it's what people want to hear, it's going to be attractive. Maybe you have to fill an auditorium, or a stadium. But if it's not sound doctrine, this is without pointing fingers, it's without naming names, it's simply saying someone can be a good speaker but if it is not sound doctrine, if it is not the word of God if it is not theopneustos then they are not a good preacher is what they say true well read the word is it there with scripture, is it conformed to scripture, is it informed by scripture, does it Fit? Does it explain? Does it amplify? Or does it stand apart or in contrast or in competition to? For our rule and our authority and our standard is Theopneustos. It is God's own words, His testimony, His story to us, and not the words of any particular speaker or teacher or preacher. And I want to offer good sermons, and I hope that it's compelling and it's, you know and all that kind of stuff, but I would rather be a lesser public speaker but be faithful in what I present. And like I said, the service itself is kind of a protection for me in that regard and for you too. So think about how the service started. You know, we come together and we sing and we pray and then we are going to read from Scripture. I didn't pick it. got nothing to do with it. The church in this wisdom has said, this is what you're going to hear today. And this is what you're going to hear because this cycle and this system has been in place for a long, 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 long time. And you're just going to have to hear it. You're going to have to deal with it. 
and I don't get to pick my favorite scripture. And I don't get to pick a verse out of context and kind of manipulate what it means or what you think it means. I don't even get to hone in on one particular thing because we're going to be given readings from the beginning of scripture to the end, from the Old Testament to the New. And we're going to be given big passages of it and not just one little verse here or there or anywhere. And every time you've heard it, you've responded, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Okay, that's the stuff I'm supposed to know. And then I get up and I start talking. And if I try to lead you off a cliff, you can just let me go. And off I go down the cliff. And you can stay instead on ground that is solid and it is strong because you just heard it. And if what I say doesn't jive with it, let me go. What I say contradicts it. Let me fall right off the cliff. And what are we doing next? I have preached. We've heard from the word, and so we ought to have something in which we can judge what I've said. But then we stand up and we affirm our faith. Nothing that I have just said or taught, but a creed that has been passed along from generation to generation that the faithful saints that the Holy Spirit has inspired the entire church and that we can repeat, we can affirm, and we can accept the foundations of our faith. And there my sermon sits in the middle, and if it doesn't fit, it gets squished. Make it squished right out of your head and right out of your heart. Because if I have not preached in concert and in harmony with the scripture you have heard and with the faith that you have affirmed, it's not good preaching. And it needs to just fall away. So, if this is indeed Theopneustos, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, and we are about to affirm the faith of the saints and the church as a whole that is founded on these words, then what does it have for us today? It has for us today Jesus telling a story with a point. And he tells this story about a widow. So she's got nothing in the world. This is someone, just by being described as a widow, who is on her own and having to fend for herself. And something's happened to her. Someone has done her wrong. Something has been unfair. It's been unjust. She's been taken advantage of. And this is lousy. I mean, it's bad enough to take advantage of anybody. But why would you possibly take advantage of sort of the, the most helpless people. But that's what happens. And so she goes to see the judge to get this fixed. And the judge, oh, he's a great and fair man. No, he's terrible. He's a lousy judge. He is an unrighteous judge. And she knocks on his door. I need your help. I need your help. And he says, so? Slam. What do I care? I'm an unrighteous judge. She's a widow. She's a nobody. What do I care? I don't. Because I'm an unrighteous. I don't care what I do. I don't care what you say. So she knocks on the door. What? I need your help. I need you to do the right thing. No! Slam the door. <sighs> what do you want? Help me. No! Slam. All night long. She knocks and she knocks and she knocks. And finally the judge says, What? What will get you to stop? What will get you to quit? I am sick of this. You're driving me up the way. You want justice? Fine. Take it. Just leave me alone. Okay, thanks, good night. <laughs> Why does Jesus tell this story? Well, there it is in the first line. Jesus tells his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. The widow knocks. And even though the judge is unrighteous and refuses to do the right thing, she doesn't stop. She doesn't quit. And eventually, the judge is so annoyed. The judge is so frustrated. The judge is so sick and tired of it, he finally does the right thing just to shut her up. How much more then will God, who is a righteous judge, and who does do the right thing always, has compassion on us, who loves and cares for us, how much more will he hear persistent prayers? If not quitting, 
will get the righteous response from a bad judge, what will not quitting get from the best judge? So pray. And don't quit. But how do we tend to pray? Oh, Lord, how vouchsafe and sanctify and pleaseth thou such a... And... Amen. Now let's forgive. And you move on to some <coughs> Well, I've got this need. I've got this concern. Well, I prayed about it. One. Last week, I think, maybe. Maybe twice. I might have been twice. Man, I prayed about that three whole times. Woo! Must be nothing. Must not have worked. You must not care. Three whole times did nothing. But is that what we are told to do by Jesus himself? Instead, to knock on the doors of heaven through prayer and to not quit, to not stop, and to not give up. To continue to pray. Well, somebody asked, would you pray for me? I've got this thing and I'm worried about it. Would you pray? Oh, sure, I'll pray. Lord, bless them and whatever it is they were supposed to do, that thing, you know, that guy and that stuff, oh, your God, you know, amen. And you walk off into your own thing. Is that the sort of prayer that we are encouraged, that we are told to do? Instead, to struggle, to wrestle, to not quit, and to not give up. Somebody tells you to pray, I really have this need, why don't you pray for them? And more than once. Why not twice? Why not three times? Why not keep on going and refusing to quit? Well, I've got this thing I'm worried about. Okay, then don't quit. And I think we, most of us, with personal experience in that, when the stakes are really, really high, when we have been in a truly terrible moment, and we pray with great fervency, and we pray repeatedly and continually, what about all those other times where it's not this enormous crisis? Do we spend time with God? Do we ask in supplication? And do we do so in a manner that's not perfunctory, that's not offhanded, that's not just once or twice and let it go, but like the widow. For I have it on good authority that if you seek, you find. And if you ask, it will be given. And if you knock, the door will be open unto you. And Theopneustos, from beginning to end, Scripture teaches this. God breathed us. Within one of my favorite stories, one of the best moments, I think, from the book of Genesis, where we have Jacob, and Jacob wrestles all night long. Now, I think to really understand this, to kind of get what's happening here, we have to back up a little bit and remember the context. So, Jacob's got a brother. His brother's name is Esau. They are twins. Okay, they're twins. Now, they were not born at the same time. Esau comes first. Well, where does Jacob come in? He's grabbing onto Esau's foot. So like from birth, we can see that uh, there's something up with this kid, right? He, he, he's, he's holding on to his brother's foot as they are born. And that's the way he is all the way through his childhood. He's the kid who just won't quit, who won't stop. He's kind of sneaky. He's sort of conniving. He's trying to get what doesn't belong to him. And he's going to do basically anything it takes to get what he wants. So the father of these two twins is Isaac. Isaac is the son of Abraham. Father Abraham, the father of the promise, the father of the covenant, the one that God takes from his homeland and says, if you will follow me, I will give you a land forever. I will build of you a nation. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars and all the world will be blessed through this promise. So we're like this close to the actual promise and covenant of God to this family. Abraham, has a child, Isaac, the son of the promise. Isaac has these two twins, sons of the promise. They're Esau and they're Jacob. So we're right here. I mean, we're just a couple of generations from the very beginning of the promise. 
Now, Jacob and Esau have not gotten along because Jacob is sneaky and he's conniving and he's hard headed and he's difficult and he wants what he wants and he tries anything to get it. The first time he really stuck it to his brother. You might remember where his brother was working out in the field and, oh, I'm going to die. I'm so hungry. I'm going to die. And Jacob is like, well, I've got food. Do you, need, do you need this? Oh, I would be happy to offer this to you. Just, you know, just a little, a little token. Your birthright. <laughs> and so Esau, who is, you know, he's about to die, and he, you know, he gets this food, but by getting the food, he actually gives to his younger brother, the one who doesn't deserve it, Esau the first, he is the eldest, all the rights go to him, he turns over his birthright to Jacob. So already, this is a relationship that is not very good. And then they get to be a little bit older. And Isaac has become an old man, he's blind, he can't see. Isaac thinks he's, he's going to die any day now. And he wants to make sure that he offers one last blessing to his eldest son before he dies. So he says, Esau, Esau, go out in the field and hunt because you're a hunter and make my favorite lunch. And by bringing it back to me, it will give me strength to offer you one last powerful blessing. And Esau's like, okay, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go out and get you the food. And Esau goes out to hunt. And who has been listening but Rachel, the mother? And she says, I've got a plan. You know how you stole the birthright from your brother? Now you can get his blessing too. Go kill a couple of goats. I will make dad's favorite meal. And you can give it to him and you can get the blessing. And they come up with this plan and it's so convoluted that in order to trick poor blind Isaac, they actually take the skin of the goats that they had killed for lunch and they put it on Jacob so that he will be hairy like his brother Esau. So he goes in to, to offer this meal to his dad and beat Esau to the punch, and Isaac knows that something's wrong. He's like, wait, wait, that sounds like Jacob. Let me feel you. Are you hairy like Esau? And he feels the skin. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. It smells like dead animals. Yep, must be Esau. Come here, Esau. I will offer you my one last final most powerful blessing. And as he does so, in walks Esau. What? Not again? No! And Rachel's like, um, you know, Jacob, this might be a really great time to go visit your out-of-town relative for the next decade. Because your brother's going to kill you dead. And off he runs. Because of what he has done to his brother, again, steals his birthright, and then even from his dying father, steals that last final blessing. That's the kind of guy Jacob is. Well, Jacob goes off, and he has adventures of his own, off with his mother's people, and something happens to Jacob. Jacob grows up. Jacob matures, I suppose. Jacob grows closer to the Lord. Jacob himself is also tricked and fooled a couple of times in some pretty lousy ways and now gets to feel what it's like to be on the wrong side. And whatever happens through this and however the Lord uses all these circumstances, Jacob becomes a good God. The years pass. The decades pass. He's built a family of his own now. He's had to have two wives because he got tricked into marrying not the one he worked for, but the one the father wanted to marry off first. But now he's settled down. He's settled in. He's got a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of people. He has become a good and a faithful man, and he is called back home. After all these years, after all these decades, it's time to finally go back home, and he's almost back home, and he gets word, your brother Esau is home. Your brother Esau has brought an army. Oh, and Jacob knows he's caught. 
And you might have become a good guy, and you might have matured and become closer to the Lord and figured out what it's like to be on the wrong end of things, but he still did it to his brother. And he did it twice. And he did it in some of the most personal and profound ways that could happen, and now the consequences were going to come. And it's only fair, and it's only right, and it can't be avoided. So the night before he is supposed to meet his brother and his brother's army, he climbs a little mountain, and he wrestles. And that's where our story begins. So what we just heard, that's the night. That's what's going to happen next. That's what's led to this point of wrestling and refusing to let go. And all night long he wrestles. All night long he won't quit. All night long he won't stop. To the point where even his leg is wrenched out of the socket. I will not let you go until you bless me. You don't understand. My brother is coming tomorrow. My brother is coming with an army. It's all my fault. It's all my responsibility. I know it's going to happen and I deserve it, but I'm scared. And I'm worried. I got I've got family now. I know it was my fault. You've got to help me. I will not let you go. I will not let you go. Then one of the most interesting things happens. The angel says, what is your name? I think he doesn't know. Of course he does. Why would he say that? Well, remember back to where this trouble hit its lowest point. As he was stealing his father's own dying blessing. And there in his blindness, with Jacob disguised and pretending, Isaac says, the voice is all wrong, but you smell and you feel right. What's your name? He says, oh, I'm Esau. Oh, okay, then come here a little blush. And now, struggling and in pain, but refusing to quit. What is your name? And more lies. No more sneaking around, no more tricks. I am Jacob. <coughs> ha, okay. I can work with that kind of honesty. But that's who you used to be. You used to be the guy that took everything you could. You used to be the guy that grabbed onto the heel of his brother, always trying to pull him down. You used to be the guy who was sneaky and underhanded. You were a thief and you stole. But now I give you a new name. Your name shall be Israel, for you have struggled with God and you have persevered. You are not tied to your destiny or your consequences any further. You have wrestled, you have struggled, you have not quit. And you have a new name. And you have a new life. And you have a new destiny. God hears our prayers. Whether it happens in the way that we want it to or not. Whether the prayers are answered in the way that we request or in some completely different way we never could have asked for or imagined. But he hears our prayers, he answers our prayers, and we are told, keep knocking, don't stop, don't quit. Be like Jacob, grab on, latch on, and do not let go. I will not let you go until you bless me. I know what I've done. I bear the consequences of this. I'm worried about my finances. I know I spent the money, I created those bills, but help. I'm worried about this medical test, but I know I didn't take care of myself. I know I didn't eat right. I know I didn't exercise, but help. This other person has asked me to pray, and, and, and maybe it's their just desserts, or maybe they're getting what they deserve, but I don't care. I don't want that for them. I need more for them. I ask for better. Please help. And to not quit, to not let go, and to not stop. 
I will not let you go until you bless me. And to keep praying. And to persevere. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but as long as it takes. As much as it takes. You might not get exactly what you asked for. It might not come exactly in the way you asked. But God hears our prayers. He answers them. So don't stop. You are not tied to your faith. Don't stop. You are not tied to the consequences even of your foolishness or your wickedness. So don't stop. What do you think Jacob was really hoping was going to happen? Like a meteor would come and crush Esau and save him from the next day? Or maybe just crush his army or, or something? Hard to imagine what he was specifically asking for, but I can tell you what happened. A humbled Israel <coughs> goes to meet his brother, who he has done everything terrible to, and his brother embraces him. You've been gone for so long. I know what's been between us. You are my brother. Always, always, always. You think Jacob expected that? You think that's what he was asking for? But that's what he got. So pray. If an unrighteous judge will listen to the repeated knocking, how much more will a righteous judge hear our prayers? So don't quit. Don't stop. You're asked to pray for something? Do it like you mean it. You have a need or a worry or concern? Pray like your life depends on it and wrestle, and struggle, and do not stop, and do not quit. But making God do stuff for us. But we are demonstrating our faith and our reliance on Him. I've got nothing else, so I will cling to you. And I will hold on to you with all my might, even despite the pain. But I will not let you go until you bless me. So ask. You will be Seek. And you will find. We can't know how the prayer will be answered we can take faith that it will be so not. All night long if you have to. And the door shall be opened unto you.